This video contains the notes for section 6.5, which is, we'll sort of retitle the calculus version of area. You might wonder why we're starting with 6.5 instead of 6.1, and uh, that's because we don't really like the order that our book um, treats this material in. So we're going to do it in a little bit of a different order, and um, that's just the way it's going to be. So um, what is uh, the calculus version of area? What does that mean? Well, you know area from geometry. You know how to find the area of a triangle or circle, squares, rectangles, and all sorts of other two-dimensional shapes. But now, um, in general, we might be interested in finding the area under some curve, a f of x from a to b like that. So we might be interested in saying, what's this area? And why would we, we be interested in that? Well, that will become, I think that's going to reveal itself later in this chapter. But uh, for now, we'll just accept that this is something that we would like to be able to calculate. And um, we're not going to get a whole lot of tools for calculating it yet, not in this section. Right now, we just want to define what exactly um, this is and how we should uh, how we should use notation to represent that. So uh, let me show you what that notation looks like. Notation. And we would say the area under f of x from a to b. And let me just explain that when we say the area under the curve, that means between the curve and the x-axis, right? So wherever the curve is, you drop straight down to the x-axis. We're talking about that area right there. We call that the area under the curve from A to B. And we write that like this, an elongated S from A to B um, f of x dx. Why this dx is here, I'm not going to explain today. Um, that will become clear later. It's a little piece of the notation. It's very important that it is there, and um, it would be getting way too far ahead of ourselves if I tried to explain that to you right now. Um, but I guess suffice it to say in the, in the same way that when we write dy dx, we know that the dx on the bottom is telling us what variable we're interested in, as opposed to like dy dt or something else. This is just telling us that x is the variable that we're interested in. That's enough of an explanation for now. So this is our notation. If you want to write the area under f of x from a to b, then we write it like this. Okay. Now. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the time when we introduce some kind of notation like this, there are some consequences, maybe unforeseen originally, the consequences that we have to deal with. Um, here, this is all fine and good. This looks like a nice, well-defined positive area. But what about if we have a function like this? What if my a and my b are here? Well, what does this mean? We could still write this area from A to B. Now, you see why I put under in quotation marks there now, because it's not really under the curve. So first of all, what area am I talking about? We're talking about the area between the curve and the x-axis. right? And here, in this case, since it's underneath, what's going to happen, the way we're going to define that is that's going to be negative that will end up being negative area. If it's below, then that will be negative. So that's just a definition. Now, that's different from geometry. In geometry, area is always positive. It doesn't matter what kind of figure you're looking at. Area is always positive. In calculus, we can have area up here above the x-axis. That's positive. And area below the x-axis will be negative. OK? Um, and also, what if we? There's nothing to stop us from writing something like, let me give you another example here. I'll draw something that looks more like the first one. Area from A to B under f of x. 
what if I wrote this, the area from B to A under f of x? There's nothing to stop me from writing that, from putting the numbers in the, uh, like the wrong order. In other words, not lowest to highest, um, from bottom to top. So what if they were in the wrong order? Well, that's also going to give me negative area. Right? If I run it backwards and say I'm going to do the area from B to A now, that makes it switch. So that gives us our first, um, our first little rule here that the area from A to B under f of x is equal to the opposite of the area from B to A under f of x. So anytime you feel like those are in the wrong order, you can switch them and just pop a negative sign out like that. That's rule number one. All right, now let's look at some other examples and see if we can get a couple more rules for how to deal with these things. What if we have a situation like this? A, B, and C. that area and then we also have this area here like that so um, let's see we could talk about a couple things here we could talk about the area from A to B f of x and we could talk about the area from B to C and I think you'd be quick to agree that if I add those together if I add this and this, what do I get? I get the area from A to C. So that gives me another rule. That's a way of combining them, right? This is another rule for how to add these things. A to B plus B to C gives you A to C. And if you play around with that, you can turn it into some other subtraction rules and so on and so on. If you combine it with, our, with the last rule about being able to switch the sign, like this, you can enter, you can mix that rule up with that one too, and you can get all sorts of different kinds of results there. A couple of homework problems will be um, using those two rules in combination. Um, that's really the basics of what we're doing now. I'm just going to give you a couple examples now of uh, situations where we can actually calculate this. So, what if I asked you to find area from zero? to 3 or 2x. Now, I don't have any like calculus procedures for doing this. So these things, everything that you're going to do tonight um, or in class tomorrow will be looking at things uh, from a geometric point of view. So I'm going to sketch a graph of this. This is the line y equals 2x. And I'm interested from 0 to 3. And when uh, x is 3, this is equal to 6. So that's a triangle, and the area of that triangle is 1 half base times height, so that's uh, 9. All right, we just use geometry to get that. Um, what about this? How about the area from negative 1 to 5 of how about, let's see, 3 minus 1 half x. So again, I'm going to sketch a graph of this. And I'm just going to plot those two points. That's the easiest way, I think, to get the first and the last. Figure out what we're looking at here. So when I plug negative 1 into this, it's at 3 and a half. 1, 2, 3 and a half. Right? And when I plug 5 into this, it's 3 minus 5 halves. That's uh, positive 1 half. All right. So this was uh, 3 and a half, and this was a half, and this is um, 6 wide. So that's a trapezoid. You can, if you want to, you could just 
chop off this bottom little rectangle and make it into a rectangle plus a triangle. But we're going to deal with trapezoids a lot, and um, so I'm going to remind you that the area of a trapezoid is me pause for a second see if you can remember what it is. It's the average of the the bases times the height. So I'm going to write it like this. Right? You could put the two under there. Right? It's the average of the bases times the height. So in this case, that's going to be the average of three and a half and one half. I'll just plug all the numbers in. So I have six over two times three and a half plus a half, and that's twelve. Right? Um, here's uh, another one. Find the area from negative 1 to 3 under the absolute value of x minus 1. Oops, I forgot the little dx there. Uh, so let's see, what does this look like? This is the absolute value function dropped by 1. So that would look like like this. So it looks like I have, remember we're always talking about area between the graph. Don't go shading under here, right? It's between this and then up or down to the x-axis. So it looks like I have some negative area and some positive area. So I need to be careful that I, I get all those right. So each one of these little triangles would be one half. So this area, that's negative one area right there. And this is a two by two triangle. So the area of that is two, right? That's positive two and negative one. So this, calculus area wise, positive and negative area cancel each other out. Negative one plus two is one. That's how that works in calculus class. And then just give you one more, actually I'll give you two more quick examples. How about from negative one to one, the square root of one minus x squared dx. Well, what is that? That is, let me pause for a second and try to remember what that is. Pause. Did you remember? That is the top half of the unit circle. So uh, what's that area? Well, it's, the, it's half the circle. So it's 1 half pi times the radius squared, which is pi over 2. Right? And then here, how about this? What's the area from 0 to 2 pi cosine x? dx. Well, cosine doesn't make any well-formed kind of uh, geometric shape, at least not one that we're, we know how to find the area of. So how the heck am I supposed to do that? Well, if you graph so from 0 to 2 pi, we'd be talking about this, this, and this, well, whatever these areas are, it looks like I have exactly the same amount of positive as I do negative, right? That and that would cancel out, and that would that, and that would cancel out. So we just have zero. Whatever these areas are, I don't know, but because of the symmetry of this uh, function, we know that um, that area would come out to be zero. So those are the basics of the notation of area and how you can do it with um, some. Uh, stuff you know from geometry. And that's all we're going to do for this first uh, section 6.5.